all right? And you kind of get that thing summarized, and then the next transition question is this. Okay, if this is true, then what do we have to do? Okay, you said if you could answer, answer this ask this question, I want to know it. And now I've given you a persuasive answer from the scriptures using very little churchy language. It's to, it, but this is through the lens of scripture. And then you're persuaded, okay, that big idea, I believe, I've never heard that before. That's awesome. That's the word of God. Wow. And they say, okay, so now close the deal, right? What do you do? What should we do? Here's what I, and, and you've been working toward this for eight weeks, and you know exactly what you want them to do. I want you to do whatever, and you tell them, do this. Then when you tell them, do this, you might have a couple of, here's how you do it, and then story. Story that shows what happens when you do this. All right? Don't miss this, preachers. You've got to have this. When you tell them what to do, this is like, okay, do this. Boom, boom, boom. And, and here's how we do it around here. We do it this way, this way, this way. And now let me tell you a story of somebody who did this, and here's what happened to them. Or let me tell you a story of somebody who didn't do this, and here were the consequences of it. This has to be emotional. It's got to pull at people. They got to say, wow, that this is the right question. And not only am I persuaded that I should do it, I feel it. You following me? Everybody follow me? I'm feeling this. I got to do this. Because you know what? If you don't do this, little girls get their nose broken at home, at school, and they go home and they die. That's one of those kinds of stories, right? Or if you don't do this, okay, and I'm going to show you almost the reversal of this in my talk, because you, you can take these panels and you can reverse them. The U panel can't come early, really, but some of these other panels can. And then the final panel is what would it look like? It's vision, your vision casting. You can vision cast every week. If we did this as a church, what would it look like in our city? What difference would it make? You know what? If we were a people who, who listened to other people's stories, do you know what would happen? People where you go to work with every day would start coming to you, and you would be known as the person who helps other people. And they would come, and they would tell you your story, and you would have opportunity to share your life with them and share the gospel with them, and change could happen. They could meet Christ because you did this. And whenever you're at school and you're known as the kid that the other kids are having problems at home and they know you've got wisdom they don't have and they can come and talk to you, you could be the one at school who does that. And if we were a church that lived this way and that happened in our community, do you know what that do to the other churches around us? And people are beginning to say, wow, yeah. I want to be a part of that. I want to make a difference. You mean if I do this, I'll be a part? Yeah. Okay, I'm in. Every week you're casting vision. Okay, now here's what I'd like us to do. This is going to, this is going to be really, you know, I don't know, might be better than anything you've preached in a while. But <clears throat> what I'd like us to do <laughs> is I'd like us to... I'd like us to take, I'd like us to take the story, one that we did this morning, um, let's take the story of uh, the, let's take the story of the paralytic, okay, good, story of the paralytic getting healed, and let's, uh, let's prepare a sermon real fast on the story of the paralytic getting healed, okay. Now, I told you at the beginning of the week, memorize this. You use it for everything. Okay, have you seen it enough times? Yeah. I mean, okay, like ad nauseum. Courtney's over here. Yeah, God, give me a break. Okay, what's the climax in the story of the paralytic? 
That's right. It's get up and walk because he says, but in order that you may know that I, the Son of Man, have authority on the earth to forgive sins, I say to you, rise up, take up your pallet, and go home. But he hadn't gotten up and taken his pallet yet, right? So that's the, that's the climax. Jesus says, I have authority. Jesus has authority to heal or to forgive or to save. Jesus has authority to save. That's the summary statement. That's what this story is about. And if he does, it means he's the Son of Man, which if it does, it means he's the Promised One, which means he's the Messiah, which means he's the one everybody's been waiting for for their whole history. Okay, that's the summary statement. Now, let's turn that into, the que into a question. What's the obvious question? Does Jesus... Can Je Hold it, let's do this. Can Jesus really save? Can Jesus really save, heal, forgive sins, get up and walk? That's what I mean when I say that, say that okay? All right, I, I can't preach that. No, Larry, you can't preach that anymore. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can keep the King James Version if you're using it, because that's like cool again, right? Just put a few candles around and use the, you know, everybody will say, that's so gothic, man. Larry will be wearing black next time we see him. He'll have a tattoo. <laughs> that's awesome, bro. All my memory work when I was young was Ain't nothing wrong with that. I used his Bible, though. I know he's not using King James. Okay. And I'm cool with it if you are. Uh, so, we got to remake this. Can Jesus really save? Now, here's something I haven't told anybody yet. I want to I want to make this can Jesus really save? That's what this story is about. Because if he can, he's God. But we're going to have to look at this through the lens of one of these characters here to get some angle on this. All right, help me rewrite this. What what is, what is this sermon going to be about? Okay, we could use the one I used this morning. I didn't even think of this. Is believing, is seeing believing. Because if we look at it from the standpoint of the religious teachers, is seeing believing. We would all say it is, right? But it wasn't in, it wasn't in that one. Huh? It wasn't for them. Okay, let's is it okay with you guys if we go with that? Okay, so is seeing believing. That's what this is going to be about. <clears throat> and now we got to ask a question that your producers are always going to ask. So what? Is seeing believing? Oh, God. And the other thing I like about this is this is kind of a catchy phrase. It's sort of easy to remember. It's a bit memorable. Is seeing, believing, and uh, and there might even be another big idea that we would come up with if we had time. We're not going to take enough time. But so what? Every producer is going to say, okay, you're going to talk on that? Fine. So what? What does it mean to anybody? Well, most people think that if I could just see it, I'd believe it. In fact, I'd like to, I, I, would, I would suggest that modern, scientific, empirical based societies, this is exactly what they say. If you can't see it, you can't believe it. And you can't see anything, God, religion, therefore none of this makes any difference. Let's all be atheists and let's make this world work. And as you know, there's a big movement among atheists to make that happen, right? Okay, so the so what is, is most people think, if I can see it, I believe it. Believing 
is belief. Okay, I'm working, man, I'm working. This is like, it's, isn't it about time to go home? Okay, so, so what do we want people to do? I want you to meet Jesus, and when you do, I want you to believe in him. So if that's it, this becomes a gospel talk, okay? That's one possibility to be a, to, that our whole goal is to evangelism, a gospel talk. Okay, now, the first thing i got to do is, is what is my, is seeing, believing. Okay, how do you personally relate to that, is that question? Do you have a, a, a time in your life where this, this takes you back to? So, you've got your story here that somehow relates to that. Then... Your, your transition is, you know, I'm not sure if I'm the only one like that or not. Have you ever felt that way? Okay. And so what are some ways that people in our culture seeing is believing? How, do they, how would they potentially relate to that? So this is a personal story. And we've had a couple of people quickly indicate theirs. Then you might say, what are some ways? I indicated one in a, in a scientific Scientific world, with a scientific world view. Let's go ahead and use that. If I can't see it, no basis for believing it. What's another way that people commonly relate to that? Assume, people commonly, we assume that it's harder to believe when don't see. In other words, if I saw it, I would believe it. We assume that to be the case, don't we? Then I'm going to come down to my big question. And my question is going to be, is seeing always believing? Okay, this is now my question, but it's not my big idea. I'm going to have another big idea. Well, there's a story in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, that answers, helps answer this question for me. And now I'm going to begin to tell my story. One way to handle it is he's just come back from a preaching tour. And everyone at his house. And I might just make a, I might just stop right there and I might do a little bit of application. I might say, hey, um, you know, when you, you come back, you want, everybody here? you want everybody at your house? And people are interacting with that. And you're saying, you know, one of, the, one of the amazing things about Jesus is how much he seems. So here's my point. Then I make my point. Jesus had a huge appetite for people. In fact, this could almost be my talk. That could almost be my talk right there. And I could start with a story of how I hate people coming to my house. Well, none of you, of course. All right. Okay. Okay, do you see what I'm doing? Yeah, people were important to him. Jesus had a huge appetite. You've got you to work these and decide how you're going to make them. And then the guy comes over. The guy, then the paralytic comes in, okay? Then the paralytic comes in. And now we bring in, you know, the paralytic. But in his friend's but he can't get in, and so a hole in the roof. So what we're doing is, is we're, we're taking the story, interspersing it with making the point and uh, application. When we care about people, we go out of our way to serve them. 
When we really care about people, we go out of our way to serve them. See how I take this part of the story and then I tagged it with a point. That's all I got to say about that. And then what I'm feeling about right here is I need some kind of little vignette. Some kind of little vignette right here to illustrate this idea of maybe a time when, you know, somebody cared about someone else and the difference that it made in their lives. And then the guys who saw it and didn't believe. Okay, we got so many different characters here. What I'm feeling like in my talk is that I've got too, many characters? too much God stuff. That I've got to take just one of them. I tell the story, or what I'm feeling now is, is I needed the story to be told somewhere prior in the service. And this would be a great place for people to use storying in the service. That prior in the service, someone comes up and instead of reading the Word of God, the story, someone comes up who knows it and they tell it. Don't dress up, but they tell it really well. And then you go on with the service. And then you come in and you're just going to pick one of the characters in that and take off on them. And then you got something that you want them to do. I want you to look briefly at the Noah story, the Noah talk. <clears throat> I want you to see how I did the Noah talk. In the Noah talk, see that where it says welcome POIs in the Bible story? This was what, I, what we did in that, that weekend is we told the Noah story very briefly. That was my telling of it. <laughs> okay, like that's super brief. So welcome POI's Bible story. I, get, I came in, I welcomed people on the internet, over in the cafe with us in the service, and then I said, hey, a couple things we need you to know today. Um, you know, but before we do, y'all greet each other. They greet one another. Then uh, did the POI's. And then I transitioned out of the POIs, points of interest, announcements. I transitioned out of those, say, hey, let's transition our, our heart and mind now. And let's just start to prepare ourselves for what God might say to us today through, the, through his word. Mr. Brent talks about the importance of our choices. That God created us with freedom so that through our choices we could honor him. But according to Genesis 6, within several generations, people were so far from God that he was grieved that he ever created them. However, there was a man named Noah who was unique in his generation, righteous man, blameless, and God told Noah something that he didn't tell anyone else. And so I came through and I told the story. Now, here's the cool thing. In every service, 10, 11, 30, and 1, I got an ovation when I finished telling the story. I don't get it. I gave announcements and told a Bible story and I got an ovation. I don't know. I don't think it was. I, I, somehow, somehow. So here's how I tagged the story. See that word says tag there? So when the flood began, Noah and his family entered the ark along with the remnant of the created animals. And when the flood was over, ten and a half months later, they walked out onto a renewed earth. Their lives saved, their future clear. Today, we're going to talk about what people, what, what we need to know to survive the exceptionally hard times of our lives. Maybe you're in one right now. Hope you find this talk helpful. Enjoy the rest of the service. We'll talk in just a minute. And I walked off. Band came back. Three more worship songs. Whoa! Awesome. Video bumper. I walk up and I started with this. Now, my introduction here, in this case, is not a me section. It's literally an introduction. I didn't do a we section here. There's a we section on the next page. This is simply an introduction because we're doing the story of the flood. So I introduced it through the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004. And I literally read this. And you see at the second paragraph, tsunami video begins with giant wall of water crushing a single man. Starting there, we ran a video that was unbelievable. Nobody was watching me. They're, they're glued on this as they watch the, the frames of this Indian Ocean tsunami come in. And so I just read it. On December 26, 2004, hundreds of tourists at exotic Thailand beach resorts saw something they'd never seen before. 
The ocean waters in front of them were literally sucked away, exposing the ocean floor below. According to one National Geographic article, the novelty of the site apparently stoked the curiosity of some who ran onto the exposed seafloor photographing the scene. If only they had known. Now that becomes a recurring phrase in my intro. Then the video starts, and I keep reading. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the earthquake that generated the Great Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 is estimated to have released the energy of 23,000 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs. Giant forces that had been building up deep in the earth for hundreds of years were released suddenly on December 26, moving trillions of tons of rock and water along hundreds of miles of coastline at speeds approaching 600 miles an hour. And at this point, the video is showing waves coming in and debris and, every, and people running for their lives. Eleven Indian Ocean countries were deluged by 50-foot high walls of water, snatching people out to sea, drowning others in their homes, and crushing people with debris. Eyewitnesses said the approaching tsunami was deafening, if only they had known. Okay, and they got in videos, I mean, it's like, so this is where you need production, right? Okay, I could have read this, and it had been okay, but with that video running, like, I could have given an invitation when the introduction was over, out of fear. It was awesome. People who survived were people who knew. And then, okay, people who knew their geography knew what the receding ocean meant. Survivors who knew reported how they ran for high ground, rounded up family members and friends, and tried to warn people who were drawn to the water's edge. A British newspaper reported that a school student whose family was on vacation in Thailand remembered her geography lesson about tsunamis and warned her family and saved them. In, 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 the Indian, in, in India, a man told the Associated Press that he recalled watching a National Geographic documentary on tsunamis, remembered the lesson, sounded the alarm, and saved his entire village of almost 1,500 people. By the end of the day, people who had started their day going about their normal lives or relaxing at exotic beach resorts were struggling with the reality of tens of thousands of dead or missing, destroyed homes and shattered lives, if only they had known. Okay, now what I'm doing there is I'm setting up the flood, right? I mean, the flood is our story today. And they're seeing a flood, they're seeing a tsunami, they're hearing what happened in it, people's lives are being destroyed, these are all the things that happened in the flood, and they're seeing a video of it. Oh, now I move into a wee section. Okay, I told you you could move some of these panels. Now I move into a wee section. You know what? We all hope we'll never face a tsunami, either literally or figuratively. We hope disaster, if it has to come, will strike somewhere else. And you know what? Usually it does. You ever think about that? Usually, disasters strike someone else, not us. But should it happen to you, will you know what to do? When a wall of debt finally engulfs you because for years you've spent more than you earn and you find yourself financially upside down, will you know what to do? When your marriage is disintegrating in front of you and you can see the fear in your children's eyes because they don't know what their future holds, if mom and dad break up, will you know what to do? When you are so depressed that you can't find a reason to get up and keep on, or maybe you can't do it without a bunch of prescription drugs, will you know what to do? When you get the news that you, not your neighbor, not your uncle, not your cousin, you have a terminal illness and eternity looms in front of you, will you know what to do? Okay, that's my we section, and it's a pretty good one. This year at City Church, now here's our, the, here's our big thing for the whole year. This year at City Church... We are teaching that the best way to live is to discover how our story fits within God's story. Because fundamentally, we believe two things. First, we believe that God knows best, and we believe that He wants us to know what He knows. God isn't trying to hide the keys to life from us. He wants us to know how to live and survive really hard times in our lives. So if we're correct about that, then we really need to know what God knows. And the story of Noah and the flood teaches us, and I read, I read did this, but how we can survive the really difficult times in our lives. So what am I talking to people about? Do you know what you need to know to survive the hard times of your life? 
and I've given them some examples. When you're depressed and you're considering suicide, your marriage is disintegrating, you're engulfed in debt, you, you know, terminal illness. Okay, these are all things that I know are going on in the people's lives. I mean, these are our people. Well, these are your people too. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like us, and this is what I said, I'd like us just to take the story of the flood. You know, there's three major characters. And I want us just to take a moment and look at each one of them and what we learn, you know, from their, from their lives in the story, and then we'll be done. First thing we need to know, we learn from God himself, and it's this. When we're struggling in our story, we need to understand that God is the central figure in every story. You know, if we learn anything from the flood narrative, it is that God determines human history in general and our lives in specific. And uh, I'm trying to remember what I said. I added something there. You know, there is a tendency to think, for us to think, that if something happens in our lives, if I can just figure it out, everything will be okay. I think I added a sentence, something like that. Well, when I, but, you know, God determines. But when I say this, I don't mean we're puppets, God's control, we're free. God made us that way because he made us in his image. We freely make our choices, but ultimately we do not control the course of our lives. Control is an illusion. You know what? And I added this. You know what? I spent my whole life thinking that if I could control my kids and my wife and my circumstances, everything would be good. Let me tell you from my own experience, control is an illusion. There's my story. There's my vignette. Okay. Okay, ultimately, life, sent, uh, and eventually, we all come to the same place, and I, and I said, eventually, we all come face to face with God. Ultimately, life centers around Him, and here's what that means. That means we need God more than anything or anyone. There's my point. Okay, that's why 2,000 years ago, God entered our world as Jesus of Nazareth, and in Jesus, He begged us to take the time to relate to him up close and in person. And how we respond to Jesus more than anything defines our lives. In fact, this is essentially what John 14, 6 means. Jesus said, and now this goes on the screens, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, what you have decided about Jesus is what you have concluded about God. Now, that statement is thrown in for people who say, you know, I think there's probably a number of ways I can get to God. Mm -mm. Whatever you've decided about Jesus is what you have decided about God. They may not agree with me, but I'm making the statement. So let me ask you, is Jesus playing the central role in your story? Does your relationship with him define you? When people get close enough to you and they rub up against you, does some of him rub off on them? Um, if I could persuade you of anything today, it would be to clarify your relationship with Jesus because in life tsunamis, it's not what you know that makes a difference. It's who you know that matters most. But there's another thing we need to know. Second, we need to know what we need to know we learn from Noah's generation. When we're struggling in our story, we need to pay attention to the warnings that come our way because warnings are actually a means of grace. You know, what do you think? Noah's neighbors thought when he was building the ark. What do you think was going on? One of my favorite comedians and part-time theologians, Bill Cosby, and you not you might know he has a rendition on this, right? And so we put Bill Cosby's mug shot up there and we played his part of it, just one minute long, his neighbor part. And the it ends with, Oh, come on, can't you give me a hint? Yeah, I'll give you want a hint? How long can you tread water? Okay. At this point, I mean I've had a tsunami flood. This is all heavy, serious stuff. Somebody needs to come up for air and laugh, okay? That's why we put Cosby in there. He, and he's, you know, he's, he, ended, he said just the opposite of what the Scripture says, but he actually came to the same point. Because 2 Peter 2.5 tells us that while Noah built the ark, and as, as best we can tell for about 100, 120 years, that he was telling his neighbors what was coming. Noah was warning them, and, uh, um, and, I, and said, so, you know, he, he was telling them what was going to happen, yet listen to what Jesus said about Noah's generation. And then I, I refer to, you know, Jesus' statement, in the day, it, as it was in the days of Noah, so it would be at the coming of the Son of Man, for in the days of Noah before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark, and they knew nothing 
about what would happen until the flood came and took them away. How could they know nothing? Well, how could they, pos you know, for 100 years he's telling them, how could they have been surprised? Maybe just like many of us, either they weren't wise enough to pay attention, they were too busy to listen, or maybe they just didn't care. God graces us through the warnings in our lives. So that's my point. And then, some, is there a red light or siren going off in your life? And I actually said, it, you know, if you step back and look at your life, is there a little yellow light beginning to flash somewhere in the corner of your eye? And are you beginning to wonder about something in your life? Maybe this, maybe this is out of kilter. Or maybe you're way down the road and there's sirens going off and there's red flashing lights and signs. Caution, stop, danger ahead. Are you paying attention? To what God is saying because they, his warnings are means of his grace. And then the third thing we need to know we learn from Noah his, himself and that is when you're struggling in your story or when we're struggling in our story we need to walk in God's ways. Noah was unique in his generation. 6.9 says so. He was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time and he walked with God. Noah knew, he knew what God knew and almost unbelievably he was the only one who knew. And that saved him and everyone in his immediate circle. Well, how did he know? Here's my big idea for the talk. If you want to know what God knows, you have to walk in God's ways. Then I did a little factoid there. Nine times in the story, God says, zero times Noah responded. Noah wasn't talking. He was listening. And we're told he did everything that God told him to do. If you want to know what God knows, you have to walk in God's ways. Then comes my me section. See? I didn't put it at the beginning of the talk. I put it near the end. And so I told a story. When we, were, when we lived in northeast Uganda, uh, I, I walked everywhere I went. I walked 1,200 miles in two years of time, about actually one year because I was gone half the time. And um, often a kind of ridiculous thing would happen. I'd be out front leading the group, <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking, I, I'd have a little conversation with myself. It's like, Witty, what are you doing out front? You don't know where you're going. But you know what? I usually stayed out front anyway. Okay, I just communicated something with you. <laughs> okay, until I would see an African snake. Okay, now everybody's listening, right? I mean, this crowd, okay. I said, you know, I know we got some tough snakes here in Texas, but I'm telling you, African snakes are incredible. I remember one time we were coming up out of this gorge, and we were in a Toyota Land Cruiser. It's like a Sequoia. Here, it's like the, you know, okay, a big fort or whatever. We're coming up, and this snake cr crawls across, and I said, instead of just going on off, or like our, a lot of our snakes just kind of lay in there saying, run over me, you know, this snake stood up on its tail, and it literally stood four feet high, and it was taken on our Land Cruiser. <laughs> wow. Okay, well... When that would happen, the guys I'm walking with, one of them was named Tubo. Tubo would jump straight up in the air and try to pull his feet up. You know, and I just said, I'm too old and, and heavy to even try. But I said, you know, a funny thing happened. Gravity seemed to work in Karamoja about like it does here. And he always came back down. Losilo, on the other hand, would take a stick. And I saw one time he took one and he just waylaid on this snake. <laughs> Way past the point it was dead. These guys hated snakes. So... When I would come across one of these snakes, I would have another talk with myself, only this time it would be a little louder. And I'd say, Witty, what in the heck are you doing out front leading this group? You're not from here. You don't know where you're going. You have the worst eyesight. I got my glasses on. You have the worst eyesight of anyone in the group. These guys have been walking these planes since they were old enough to walk. And then I'd say something like this. Let them lead because they know something you don't know and they see something you can't see. Then my next step was to move to the back of the line, let them lead, and walk in their ways. Okay, now we're at you section. Is there a place in your life where you really need to take the next step to walk in God's ways, but you haven't done it yet? Specifically, what I have in mind was there ever a time in your life where God told you something? Maybe last week, maybe last month, maybe last year, maybe many years ago, and you have never done what he asked you to do. 
If you want to know what God knows, you have to walk in God's ways. You've got to take the next step. Are you, you know, maybe you're facing a tsunami. Maybe some of you would say, Witty, I'm already underwater. I'm underwater in my marriage. I'm underwater financially. I'm underwater at work. We're underwater at home. 2,000 years ago. Or, and then I also say, if you were to die unexpectedly today, do you, are you sure what eternity would hold? 2,000 years ago, Jesus came. He died for you so you can live with him. If it would be helpful today, we want to assist you to take your next step. Now, here's my you. Here's what I want them to do, right? And we've been working toward this. We got guys out on the plaza. We got, like, volunteers out there. And we're, our goal was to move people out of that auditorium to our small groups, tables, and recovery ministry and all the things we offer to try to help people to take their next step with God, whatever that was. If their next step was to start a relationship with Him, do that. If it was to join a small group, do that. If it was to get your kids and whatever, do that. And we had people all out there to help them do that. No pressure, take the next step. And then, because in difficult times, it's not what you know that makes a difference, it's who you know. And that's why, you know what? That's why we exist. To help people find God. Because none of us has arrived yet. We're all just trying to take the next.